Okay, so I've been asked basically to talk a little bit about the historical background to today and particularly about to prov provide some historical context to discussions about craft in a world that's not just about mass production but about mod possible models for digital production and digital craft as well. And particularly where you're looking at a world where issues of globalization, outsourcing of labor, have had a huge impact on craft and manufacturing practice. And I wanted to talk about the historical background to some of those changes, particularly in relation to how they influence attitudes to technology and craft in this sort of post-industrial world. And particularly because whichever those attitudes and models are adopted have a huge impact on the future of craft in a wider form, but also very particularly in Ireland. And this is why quite a lot of this is going to talk quite specifically about the particularly historical context of craft production in Ireland and the values associated and attached to it. In, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to... I, I know I'm starting off sort of pre-industrial up to the present day, but I'm not going to do an enormous survey of everything from, you know... 16 whatever up to, to yesterday, what I'm going to do is just pick out a couple of moments, particularly about organised interventions in develop, trying to develop Irish craft, and look at particularly how Irish national identity has related to those things. And my PhD is, it's actually about technology in Ireland in the 20s and about the Shannon scheme, but I've spent quite a lot of the last couple of years looking at issues about Irish national identity and technology and how they developed in the 1920s particularly. But it's re been really interesting for me to take some of those ideas and expand them into a wider time period and a later time period coming much more up in relation to contemporary practice. So the first point basically is looking at ideas about craft and technology as categories. And I mean, I know this is something that you don't particularly if you're involved in practices, don't spend, tend to do an awful lot of us to stop and look at what do these things actually mean? What are you actually talking about when you use those words? And I mean, I don't want to get into the huge debate of what is craft, because you can go on for a, pretty much as long as you want with that one. Um, but I've got a couple of things up here, which are, the first one is a definition of craft from the Indicon report for the Crafts Council of Ireland. Where from it's from two years ago, talking about the art craft as it's being highly intensive micro businesses and defining craft workers as those apply skills and practical arts. Second one is from Northern Ireland report from this year, which is just sidesteps the whole thing. It's contemporary craft is clearly a term that's open to different interpretations, and then goes on with the actual report. And what's interesting about that is, on the one hand, it's they're finding it, it's this idea of finding it hard to define what craft is. And even within that report, they range from saying, well, how many makers are there in Ireland? It's estimates between, you know, five and a half and 11,000, depending on how you define the whole thing. But the third one is from Malcolm McCullough, who's talking about the idea of, it's actually from a text where he's talking about the persistence of craft in, in a digital world, but he's talking about it's the idea of the application of personal knowledge to the giving of form, and it's about the individually prepared artifact and an application of skill. So it's just that idea, particularly about the individually prepared artifact, in a, on a small scale. So it's sort of one-off rather than anything else that I just wanted to point out there. And in relation to that, is just looking a little bit at the concept of technology then, because on the one hand. It's something that tends to be talked about in a slightly kind of nervous fashion. They're talking about, oh, you know, something, what, what is technology doing these days? And, you know, how is this affecting our world? Um, as something kind of slightly arcane, rather nervously, it's kind of slightly unfriendly. And as something that kind of has a tendency to fall over in dramatic ways if somebody looks at it wrong. Um, particularly if you're talking about things like, you know, recent banking controversies. Um, and one of the things about the term technology is it's used in a very, tends to be used in a very blurry way. It means different things at different times and not always used in a very precise manner. This is a, a lovely quote from Leo Marx. It's calling it an ambiguous, unspecific, indeterminate, well nigh indefinable concept. Like, That's really helpful. It's really great. Um, but 
you get the term technology, sometimes it's used to talk about computers. Sometimes it's used to mean machinery, equipment. Sometimes it's used as a way of covering up human error. You know, if you outsource all of your IT systems to another continent and then don't actually train them how to, to use them. Oh, it's a, te a technological problem there rather than a, a, actually a human one and an organizational one. But it's the whole idea that by technology being order imposed on scale and the apparatus derived from applying the results of study. And I'll come back to that in a, in a minute again, where you're looking at the difference between, in some ways, how close craft and technology are to each other with some differences. But there's the, within the idea of technology then, there's a really large difference between something that's technological and something that's technical. And there's an author that I read an awful lot of, which is a, a man called Ar Arnold Pacey, who's a technology historian. And he spent an awful lot of, lot of time like, working with NGOs and looking at things like the provision of clean water in rural Indian villages and things like this. How does it actually work? And one of the really interesting things I took out of that is the difference between technical issues and things that are technological. And what he's basically, here's a lovely diagram from his, scan from his book. He's talking about the whole idea of things that are technical, which are about techniques, skills, tools, machinery, equipment. The, the very, is a much more restricted definition of technology or the technical. Whereas what he's talking about, the whole idea of techno, the technological as being the much broader sense. So you're looking about the impact of things like culture, about how your technology is organized, having, and that having a huge impact on, that tech, on technology. But he's talking about using these two different terms in two different ways. So if you're talking about a strictly you know, technical aspect of glass making, or the wider technological context of that, including the cultural and the organization, and, you know, including things like um, laws, using things like people's beliefs, their ethical values and all, the, all of those ideas, as opposed to those very specific things like what is the temperature of that, that glass mess? Because those technical things can be much more quite, quite straightforward and to do with scientific principles, rather than the wider, wider legal frameworks or political interventions and so on. I mean, one of the examples I'd use a lot uh, for this is looking at, I've got two different 1950s cars in here. Um, Basically, the reason why I was using these because it's a really nice example of the same sets of te the technical. So you've got in combustion engines, uh, specific things about the ductility of steel, about rubber, about materials, about processes, about how things are made that are the same for both of these two examples. But you come up with completely radically different cars. I mean, you've got a little 19... 50s Italian Fiat at the top, and then this large um, cruiser, American cruiser down at the bottom, basically because of the cultural contexts that those technical things have been are being produced in. Um, so you've got radically different types of cars. The technological is really, really different, and it's it's to do with the social and cultural context that that's quite quite different in both. It you know 1915 it is Italy and 1950s America, where this is going basically is looking at the cultural context of craft making in Ireland. It's developed in a very specific set of cultural circumstances and political circumstances and economic circumstances and legal circumstances as well to an extent. And it's influenced by political history, by landscape, by our attitudes to materials, to historical focus, you know, ideas about rural life rather than urban life and so on. And the technical constraints of the materials and techniques, they might not differ all that much from Ireland to Berlin to Tokyo, but how they're actually used and how, for example, why we would focus on particular techniques or materials vary hugely. And it's for cultural and social reasons that you have choices and decisions made. Like, why do you use a particular dye? Has it got something to do with a particular piece of countryside? Why do you use a particular pattern or a particularly expressive shape? They're all to do with cultural and social decisions. And 
that's, that's one of the things that's really, really important about looking at the context of craft in Ireland is that cultural context. And very much then going back to the idea about the differentiation between craft and technology, it's from a historical point of view, it's the product of the Industrial Revolution, the whole idea of technology. Because you go back to the medieval concept of the seven mechanical arts, which are weaving, blacksmithing, actually the contrast isn't great on that, but war, navigation, agriculture, hunting, medicine, and theatre. But, um, very important, <laughs> theatre. Um, but looking at increasing applications of scientific principles to mechanical aspects, particularly of making, in 18th century Western Europe, sparking off the Industrial Revolution, really as a sort of a large-scale paradigm shift and in, in a change in methods of production and methods of distribution from what you've got is, this is weaving here in the, the front, um, from, this is from Giotto's Campanile in Florence. It's at seven panels for the, the seven mechanical arts. But the whole thing about the move from a system which is entirely handcraft based or handmade to one that's largely based on steam production as, and it's also been seen as having two phases really um, you get a lot of discussion about sort of the, oh, the Industrial Revolution, which is kind of a misnomer because the whole idea of a revolution is something that changes really quickly and abruptly, whereas the Industrial Revolution, I mean, there's apart from the fact that nobody can seem to decide how long it was, that, but you're talking about you know, something like 150 years at one, by one yardstick, you know, 80 or 200 different start dates, different finish dates. But it's a very, it's useful, it's a recognised term. So you're looking really sort of maybe the middle of the 18th century up to the middle of the 19th century, what's been termed as the first industrial revolution, much more to do with move from largely handmade production, lots and lots of agri agriculture, to factory production, development of steam and so on. Um, this is... Newcomen's engine from the 18th century. But looking at things like uh, the mechanisation of the textile industry in the north of England, uh, refinement of production techniques for coal and iron, the development of steam power, expansion of trade networks, canals and rail railways. So all of these products can be distributed in a much larger network. But it's looking at context where it's the, the idea of technology is very much in, in developed at this point and it's developed at this point it, this is the point where it develops and it separates out from this idea of the mechanic arts um, and even particularly as well if you look at the background of how where the word technology is being used it doesn't start to get used until the, the late 19th century and um, but it's one with it going back with a Greek root which is techno and logia and what's I think is interesting about it is that the first bit which is techna a lot of the time it's translated as craft when the word appears by itself and the logia is a lot of the time it's about speaking and about saying but it also means a kind of a system as well and so you're looking at really a, a technology as a system of crafts rather than anything else or a system of skills or techniques generally historically operated by more than one person at a time. But this whole idea about technology as being something that's a, a sophisticated way of manipulating materials using particular sets of skills to make some, uh, some sort of an end product, that's the same across both of them. And in a lot of ways, I mean, you look at something like a hand loom, it's a piece, that's a piece of technology just as much as a computer is. It's just a different type of technology. Um, and, you know, the same thing as something like a kiln being electrified as well. But the difference a lot of the time, is, but though, is how the two different areas are understood quite often by the general population where craft has, production has been around a lot longer. It's a, a lot of the time it seems to be easier to relate to and it's easier to romanticise as well. And not rather than technology, which can be more sets of systems hard and in a lot of ways harder to understand and easier to feel threatened by as well. Um, and one of the important things about the idea of technology that differs from craft is that 
involvement of the idea of it being a driver of social change, that you use technology to change society. Um, and I think a lot of it comes from the way that this developed with the Industrial Revolution. There's a lot of social changes happened, kind of chicken and egg scenario. But the idea of progress has been really intertwined with the idea of technology that, you know, oh, you can use technology to br bring a better world and sort of improve. So this is what the future is going to actually look like. These are uh, French postcards from 1910 about what the year 2000 is going to look like. And this is tailoring in the year 2000. This is machinery. This is architecture and building in the year 2000. But, you know, it's this idea of being be able to use technology to try and make a better world. And that's something that really drove the idea of the, the second industrial revolution, the desire to move away from kind of the, right, the dark satanic mills, everything's covered in coal and dirty and filthy, and uh, you know, try and find a clean, bright new world where you're less likely to have your ch fingers, children's fingers accidentally chopped off while they're in work. Um, so you have an awful lot of the idea of development of what, you know, this is what this new world is going to be like particularly tied up with ideas about electricity and electrical power generation, and electrical light, and so on. So, but developing in with this whole paradigm about mass production and the production line, and at the same time as developments in material science and communications as well. And what's particularly relevant here is that how much of we, what we think of the modern world would have developed at this point. And I mean, most of the time, sort of the sort of second industrial revolution is really pitch somewhere between the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, so maybe up to the First World War, maybe the Second World War, depending on who you talk to. But that sort of period where you have the world of motor cars and newspapers and radios and typewriters and the ability to buy cheap mass-produced objects to, to furnish your home, that's when this world developed. And it's the modern world. A lot of it is about city life and urbanism. And this is something that uh, another author that I've been looking at, which is Clifford Geertz, he talks of, he's talking about this whole idea of a world of sort of the sense of non-stop dynamic change developing at this point. And he's talking about it in the context of the idea of what he calls epochalism, and it's the idea of the spirit of the age. That it's, he and he ties it very much into, this is the development of the modern world and, but very much tied into the development of new nations in the late 19th century. We've got large groups of people starting to kind of self-identify as being a specific nationality outside of a kind of a, a feudal or a colonial system and pushing for self-determination, which might sound a bit familiar. Um, and he talks about different stages involved in the creation of a nation. It goes through from sort of inspirational stages in the late night or the early stages up to post-independence creation of a nation, how do you actually create, create the sort of signs and symbols of that and get your nation recognized as a proper nation. And this is something where he's talking about it being a particular epochal thing to have your new nation recognized within the community of nations as a new one. Um, and there's, I know it's not strictly anything, but I don't know if any of you have seen it, there's an Eddie Izzard sketch about have you got a flag? <clears throat> He's basically talking about this colonial idea of going, you know, going off to somebody else's country, landing somewhere and going, do you, oh, right, I claim this for my country. Do you have the locals, do you have a flag? Okay, no, you're not actually a country. I've got to stick a flag here. If you have a flag, then you're actually a proper country. Mm -hmm. And it's very much this, this whole idea. And it's really relevant to Ireland in particularly late 19th century, of all these symbols of nationhoods, it's sort of, you know, you've got the harp, the sunburst, the wolfhound from the 19th century, being developed in the early 20th century into a whole set, a working set of symbols during the 1920s and onwards. So you have things like the sets of the designs of the new coinage in the 1920s and definitive stamps, and the, and the settling on a specific flag, which is very important, the tricolor rather than different green flags. But this is bringing me around to the other half of Geertz's idea, where he's talking on the one hand about this idea about epochalism, but on the other hand about the idea of how particular, the expression of the particular nation, or the particular expression of a nation, that he's talking about the indigenous way of life, or the essentialism. And because the whole thing about 
epochal is that it's talking about universal concepts that are the same, they don't change too much from different nation to nation. It's about being kind of part of that modern world and part of the community of nations. But this idea is about the specific characteristics by which a nation defines itself. And quite often this has got something to do with specific the use of a particular language or people being from a particular ethnic grouping. But it's also very often associated with traditions and history of people and so on. And often quite closely tied to the physical geography and the landscape as well. And this is something that's very much the case in Ireland, where you've got particularly the importance of the west of Ireland landscape as something that's really central for the imagining of the nation in these early stages, particularly in including things like, and this is w, uh, Jack Yates' image of the West of Ireland peasant who's the, the pure, noble, heroic figure, rather than some, the way that would have been imaged previously in the 19th century. But it's part of this strategy, particularly about defining what is Ireland at this point. And well, how is it different from Britain? as well, particularly when you have Britain being characterised as being industrial, being urban. So you have the, the flip side of that as well, then Ireland were rural or traditional. And particularly as well, the other strategy is looking to the past for inspiration as well. And this is something you particularly have during the same point, late 19th century into the early 20th century with the Celtic revival. So you've got lots of antiquarian interest in things like early Celt Christian manuscripts and metalwork and so on, and being presented and being reused as signs and symbols of the new nation. You've got the Brian Brew harp from Trinity up here, and then the, the great seal of the Irish state, um, which has ended up being used on the back of all our coins mm -hmm. up until today, in, in today as well. But what you also end up with is a a, a lot of Celtic revival craft work, which is using direct inspiration from medieval and from early Christian work. And, you know, you're talking from chairs, I got the next one, uh, jewellery, church vestments, the whole lot, as, but as part of a search for political independence, but a cultural emphasis to that as well. So it's not just about being politically, politically independent, but also having a cultural background to that, sort of cultural, bolstering the argument about being separate, even if you have to go back seven centuries for that, that's beside the point. Um, and it's one that would have acquired hugely romantic overtones, both from this political dimension to it, and also from position of being within a, a mass produce, a world of mass production. And what you have happening is the importance of craft to the national project being hugely important. It's hugely tied in together. And on the one hand, it's because a lot of the, the materials and the techniques are very close to the original models, but also it's a rejection of what was seen as Britain's work identification as being the workshop of the world in the late 19th century, this is going to be the complete and utter opposite. And it's a really good example of this tension between essentialism and epochalism, because it's completely, it's about being essentially Irish, but it's only necessary in a modern world. If, you, if you're not in the modern world, you don't have to prove that you are particularly Irish, or partic you know, inspired by particular historical models or, um, or so on. But, and this is something that you get really apparent in the early years of the 20th century. You've got ideas from the British Arts and Crafts movement as well coming into the Irish craft scene and lots of small craft industries being set up, being inspired by British reformers. This Morris, Ashby, and Gimson and so on. This is Gimson's the furniture workshops in, uh, in the Cotswolds. But you've got guilds and schools of handicraft in Britain which are being inspired by they're basically to the rejection of the social effects of the Industrial Revolution rather than anything else. It's a way of going back to older models of practice and different ty and older types of inspiration to try and roll back the clock to before the Industrial Revolution. Although with Morris and Co, the, the irony of the whole thing is that because they're doing this in an industrial world, they're not able to produce 
solid, honest objects for, for everyday people. What they end up producing is luxury objects for an, an artistic elite. But there's also a very strong argument that what Morrison Cohen, the arts and crafts movement, their legacy, is that they stood and challenged the status quo and said, you know, everybody's making things by machine, why do we have to do that? And to start a debate about ethical production and the ethics of where something actually came from and who made it. And I mean, it's not something that's anywhere near resolved, but it's still a, a live issue. And this is hugely influential on Irish craft in the early 20th century. This is it's a photograph of, uh, from the Dunemer uh, Guild in, outside Dublin, on the outskirts of Dublin. But you have a huge amount of work in a variety of media, and this real sort of flowering of Irish craft during this period. So there's metal work and enamel work and stained glass, and statuary, and lace making and illustrations and so on. And But what they all have in common is a, an emphasis on the essential qualities of Irishness as defined by historical inspiration and manufactured by handmade methods and very much emphasising the importance of the essential in, Ir in Irish making. And I mean, partly this is to do with this inspiration by Morris and Ruskin and so on, but a lot of it is to do with the structure of Irish production at the time, where it's hugely unindustrialised. Un um, and there's something like, I mean, there's a 1926 census, there's something like 8% of the population is involved in any sort of manufacture. And there's more than 50% involved in agriculture. So it gives you an idea of what people were doing and working out across the whole country. But, um, and as this is a poster from, that Luke Gibbons reproduces, which is missing the Industrial Revolution is the best thing that ever happened to the Irish. It's an IDA poster from the 80s that picks up on this. You know, oh, we didn't have the Industrial Revolution here. So, um, And it's this whole idea that Irish made is handmade, Irish made is craft made, and that buying craft is a patriotic gesture as well. And it's providing an awful lot of focus and sort of an extra emotional charge to the whole, the, the whole enterprise as well. And I, it's something that I would argue it's remained strong throughout the 20th century. And it's given this emotional weight to this there's a negotiation between the essential and the epochal as well. And it's also had an influence on what's being written about, what's being studied, what's being taught as well, where you have the sort of foundational texts of the field are about the arts and crafts movement. Um, and if anybody wants references afterwards, I can give you a lot. Um, <laughs> but, and it's only in last, the last few sort of more recent years that it started to move out to look at more modern manifestations of Irish craft with the sort of critical eye, but, um, and it's something that it's quite interesting to look at if, I can't come to Kilkenny and not talk about Kilkenny design, it has to, you know, particularly because of the context of where we are and what we're actually talking about, that I wanted to just look briefly at this other pivotal intervention in the relationship between craft and industry in Ireland in the 20th century. And I mean, you're talking about the 1960s now, rather than, um, oh, sorry, that's another Dunemer tapestry. I forgot. So we're talking about the 1960s, a later period where epochal ideas are much more prominent than in the 1920s. So, you know, you're looking at the Lamas government promoting industrial production, um, setting up, there's the IDA working away, the Chorus Troctala, um, getting involved with the you know, Scandinavian report setting up of the, the Kilkenny Design Studios and their Kilkenny Design Workshops as well. And the, a lot of this is pretty well documented, but so I'm not going to go through any sort of comprehensive history of that, but just point out a few things about it that make it quite unique and interesting. And I mean, one of it, them is that it's quite often it's lauded as the first state-sponsored design consultancy, but it's also the first state-sponsored set of workshops looking at existing Irish craft at the time. So you're looking at things, uh, metal workshop, weaving, textile printing, ceramics, and woodworking. And a lot of influence of, so there's some of the original um, staff from Kilkenny Design, and looking at, at the involvement of European mentors coming over from countries that were seen to have worked out some sort of a successful negotiation 
between craft and industry and between sort of national identity and the need to be modern at the same time. Um, and you have examples like this is a piece of wooden furniture that was designed for RD furniture, where you think it's like Danish craftsmen, wood craftsmen being brought over to Ireland to work with Kilkenny Design and then our, for RD furniture to produce wooden furniture that is mass produced but uses craft techniques and is based on handmade and sort of historical models. And it's along the lines of a lot of, of wooden furniture production in Denmark. So I think it's a lot of it's a, a project about trying to sort of renegotiate this balance between the two things, between sort of the, the epochal and the essential. And in relation to not just what was going on in Ireland at the time, but also what was going on in the wider world in Europe. And this is actually quite interesting as well, because there's my colleague in NCAD, Anna Moran, has written an article recently about Kilkenny design craft work and how it was actually presented in American department stores. And she's looking at where, a point where a lot of the work is actually quite modernist in the sense of being quite simplified shapes and, um, and quite, quite sort of rationalized. But it's been, how it's being presented to an American audience is this very romantic, very sort of traditional um, fashion. And this one is, this one is, this is in New York um, during the 1970s. And it's this sort of continuing tension between the two things that it's quite interesting to see how are they being reconciled at different points. Um, particularly at a point where you're looking at things like, you know, entry into the EEC, these is sort of worldwide epochal issues are, are very central. And basically, so I mean, that, that's looking at an, a much earlier set of examples and just before I finish up, as I am winding up now, um, I just wanted to bring this a little bit more up to date and talk very briefly about more recent developments, which I'm sure are going to be talked about in a lot more detail later on today. And one of the important things about it, about this is that the way that the world has changed in recent decades, you're looking at development of digital technology, information technology, and particularly in Ireland as well. You're looking at huge growth in the 1990s of information technology, industry and companies, particularly in and around Dublin. So you've got international companies like Intel and Hewlett-Packard and Microsoft and Google and so on. This is one of uh, Mark Curran's photographs of Hewlett-Packard workers from his breathing factory project from a few years ago. But you've got all of these international companies being attracted into Ireland for political reasons in the sense of its tax breaks that is actually attracting them to produce, uh, to set, have manufacturing facilities here. But this was ended up having a spin-off of an awful lot of smaller companies and sort of startup companies involved in things like you know, touchscreen kiosks and e-learning and online mapping and so on. But you combine this with the increasing availability of very sophisticated telecommunications. So you're looking at things like m mobile phones, broad, wide, broad wide availability of broadband, um, that you've got even more isolated parts that would have been traditionally isolated parts of the country can easily uh, explore the advantages or the pitfalls of this wider globalised world. And this is something that um, the musician Brian Eno talks about, is the idea of the big here. And he's actually talking about it in the context of music, but he's talking about the ability to communicate or have communication between very broad spread of people who are interested in the same sort of things and sort of very far-flung people. Um, but at the same time, what that has the effect of calling attention to the specificity of regional production. So he's looking at things like world music and ha being able to have musicians from Nigeria and from Japan and Ireland play and, and inter interact with each other, discuss ideas with each other, but also it, 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 it at the same time, it makes those individual traditions much more important. And this is something we were talking about last night, about being in, recently in Tokyo, being in a shop and having Irish traditional music being played over the speakers, because this was being promoted as an idea of authentic production, authentic Irish production. Um, but it's this whole idea about having global digital communication 
and that there's a lot of debate about whether or not this is the start of another paradigm shift or another shift into a third industrial revolution. The, the Economist thinks it's a third. We're in a, the start of a third industrial revolution um, where you can sit at a keyboard and uh, produce airplanes. Um, which is, which is technically kind of possible. It's not quite as simple as that graphic, but um, but even where you, before you start talking about things like three D modeling or laser sintering or production as design tools or uh, production processes, but looking at a shift in production from mass produced multiple articles to one off customizable pieces. Um, and if you're looking at things like sort of this is a, a maker bot 3D printer that can produce a one off customizable artifact, it can be 3D model transmitted digitally printed at a destination. Um, but what's really interesting about this is that if you're looking at a shift in production to back to the idea of one off customized artifacts. What are the kind of social and economic systems that are developing around that? And particularly the cultural as well. What, is, what are the implications for an Irish context? Um, very low setup costs, not location dependent, different from pre industrial production in that way. But it's in a lot of ways, it's the complete opposite of having kind of these giant factory complexes to produce, produce your objects. And what I think is important about it is the, the re increasing importance of the individual maker. A lot of it coming from kind of DIY traditions and sort of hacking ideas, but this idea of the importance of the individual maker beco becoming much more current, not so much current, because it's never gone away, but it's being framed in a new context, which I think is quite interesting, particularly to anybody who's been involved with a, a very long tradition of small-scale one-off production. So, I mean, really what I've got is I've got two questions for all of you. I'm not expecting an answer. It's not kind of I'm going to expect answers at the end, but um, it's more just two things to think about, really, rather than anything else. And... A lot of it, I mean, this, these are issues that are going to come up again with, with other people's talks and later today, I think. But one is, can, if you're looking at this sort of third industrial revolution or the more globalised world, can that actually provide, what is the place of somebody who's a, a craftsperson in that for producing one-off customised artefacts and to, for making beautiful, ethically produced objects as well? You know, is it possible to get fulfill Morris's aspirations to produce these sort of, sort of objects in this context. And then the second part of it is really that how do you make this work in an Irish context, particularly about trying to find this balance between working in a, in a sort of essentialist globalised world and finding a working synthesis with producing craft work that's essentially Irish as well at the same time. And negotiation the two, so um, I'm just looking forward to seeing what everyone else thinks on that. So. Okay, let's be done. So much. Okay. Okay.